Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to uh, Nina and everyone at Biohack Village for having me. Um, my name is Anthony DeFranco, and I'm one of the founders of the Open Insulin Project. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, general uh, problem that we're addressing and how we're approaching it and uh, how you all can uh, maybe get involved if you're interested. So uh, let me begin. Um, the basic uh, fact is that uh, worldwide, 50% of the people who need insulin to survive don't have access to it. Um, and when we uh, take that figure into account and um, also look at the uh, population of people worldwide with diabetes and uh, some bounds that we have on the death rate that's directly attributed to it. And we also look at the uh, insulin uh, access statistic here and uh, we put all of the uh, information we have together to get a rough estimate of uh, what the uh, impact of this situation is where, you know, fully half of people who need insulin to survive can't get it. Um, a very rough order of magnitude estimate is that uh, about 20 million people, uh, you know, 10 to 20 million people a year are dying uh, due to lack of access to insulin worldwide. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, 12 million people per year was the uh, rate that people were dying due to World War II from all causes, uh, which was the deadliest conflict in history. So um, this uh, situation where half of the people in the world lack access to insulin uh, is really a uh, crisis on uh, a historic level. You know, it's something that it's hard to find anything that, that compares to this. Um, however, unlike uh, a war or, a, you know, a very uh, kind of uh, complex problem like that, um, the fundamental technical realities of, of making insulin and getting it to people are fairly simple. So um, we're going to look a little bit at why, despite that, um, there is a problem. Uh, of this magnitude and how we can try to approach it and how we are trying to approach it in the Open Insulin Project. Um, so that that's kind of the worldwide situation. Um, in uh, here in America, where the many uh, people in the project are based, um, we know a little bit more. Um, now the worldwide situation is uh, largely due to um, you know supply chain issues and uh, the kind of geopolitics around uh, different countries' access to markets, so um, those issues don't really exist within the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has plenty of infrastructure to get insulin to people. Um, you know uh, the technology to produce is well established here. So um, it's a little even even more puzzling to note that there's still a significant problem in the US. Um, so we want to look a little bit at that. Um, so uh, here are some figures on uh, just the prevalence of diabetes in the US. Um, you know, almost half of people have uh, either diabetes or a, a risk of developing it in a fairly short term. Um, just diagnosed diabetes alone is a over $300 billion a year cost uh, for everyone. Um, having diabetes it significantly increases overall healthcare costs. Um, and uh, a bit more detail on how uh, you know, diabetes is contributing to the 
but well, death rates, and this is another kind of data point, uh, a little bit more specific about what we were talking about earlier, where, uh, you know, we can actually uh, say that the d deaths are directly attributable to diabetes, uh, also uh, quite significant. Um, so, you know, why, why is this eminently treatable disease uh, still causing so many deaths and uh, why is lack of treatment even in uh, an industrialized, uh, advanced uh, technologically and infrastructurally uh, country like the U.S., you know, why is this disease still causing so much harm and, and so much uh, clearly preventable death? Um, well, one of the uh, factors is that the, uh, you know, supply of insulin, even though it's very easy to make it, empirically speaking, just has a, a lot of trouble reaching the people who need it. Um, and the first step in that process is uh, the manufacture of it. And um, globally, uh, three manufacturers control uh, almost the entire uh, supply of insulin. And that is true in the U.S. as well. It's true everywhere. Um, so, uh, you know, already we're seeing that at the very first step in the supply, there is a, a kind of a, a restriction that may prove significant. Um, and uh, as a result, the uh, list prices have risen uh, on a, you know, roughly exponential trajectory. Um, so, uh, this has been part of a pattern of all of the major manufacturers raising their prices at about the same time by about the same increment for decades. And, um, you know, this has resulted in the list price becoming, uh, unaffordable for many people. Um, and because of the complexities in the U.S., for instance, uh, you know, the U.S. kind of has a strange healthcare system where, uh, you know, some aspects of the uh, prices are subsidized in various ways by you know, different parties who negotiate amongst themselves. You know, there's a very complex system involving insurers and manufacturers and pharmacy benefits managers and pharmacies. Um, and there's a set of complex and mostly secret agreements among them as to, you know, what people are actually paying. But anyone who doesn't have insurance, um, which, you know, is tied to having a job uh, largely in the U.S., uh, you know, they're likely to have to pay that list price and to be unable to afford it. Um, so this is, you know, uh, implicated in what the problem may be as we come to understand it more. Um, and then the, the uh, result of that has been that one in four people with diabetes in the U.S. Uh, have uh, reported rationing their insulin and uh, not taking as much insulin as you need puts you uh, immediately at much greater risk of complications of diabetes. Uh, in the short term, you can develop uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is uh, potentially deadly within hours or days. Um, and in, in the longer term, if you're not taking as much insulin as you need, uh, you can develop the longer term complications of diabetes, which are many of which are listed here. You know, uh, blindness, cardiovascular disease and amputations, for example. Um, so it's, it's a rather grim situation, but it's uh, kind of difficult to uh, understand uh, why this would be the case since insulin in some form or another has been uh, produced as a medicine for almost a century. And even the... Uh, State of the art forms of insulin, uh, you know, the most modern forms that we have are uh, largely off patent. Um, so, why is it that there's still this access crisis? Why are only 
uh, you know, three manufacturers still controlling almost the entire market and able to price the insulin out of reach of many people. Um, so uh, there have been some investigations into this um, where people have looked at the uh, price uh, increase patterns and are you know finding evidence that there may be collusion. So you know some of these cases are still in progress here. Um, but you know the fundamental reality is that um, you know whether or not there is uh, explicit collusion here, uh, there is this pattern of price increases and um, it has become unaffordable and. Um, uh, at the technical level, there's really not that much of a challenge to making insulin. So um, that's what we're focusing on now in our project is how to make insulin. Um, so th this is part of a broader problem in uh, how uh, healthcare and uh, the economy around medicine is uh, you know, thought to uh, what the, the kind of dominant philosophy and how to manage it is. Um, there was a, uh, uh, a kind of economic theory that gained uh, a lot of credibility in policy circles in the mid 20th century that uh, said that, uh, you know, making medicine is, is, is kind of uh, different from uh, other economic activities in that uh, subsidies are needed to uh, do all of the research involved and that uh, a monopoly is uh, an expedient form of subsidy. So that, uh, you know, that would be a, a sensible policy is to, to tolerate and even encourage uh, monopolies around medicine. Um, and, and these claims actually collapse fairly quickly under scrutiny. Um, you know, most of the R and D, uh, involved in making medicines is, uh, already done with public money in, uh, universities and, um, the companies themselves, uh, spend much more of their own budgets on, on other things like marketing and executive compensation than they do on R and D and, also, this belief that monopolies are essentially harmless uh, has been, you know, roundly debunked since then. Um, but nonetheless, that's the system that uh, we've inherited. So um, the result of this is that, you know, we've had this uh, si complex system of agreements grow up around it, uh, you know, with the all of those other, you know, parties like pharmacy benefits managers that we'll look a little bit more at later in the presentation. And, um, you know, they kind of partition up the market and um, it's very difficult to do anything uh, outside of one of these, these kind of proprietary partitions uh, or to go between them, you know, even to the point that uh, some people who are uh, allergic or don't tolerate one brand of insulin are unable to get it covered by their insurance because the insurance uh, only covers one brand at the you know preferred tier. So even when there's clear medical necessity, it still doesn't matter um, in this system. So you know it's it's kind of a uh, it's not much of an economy in the end because it's so thoroughly um, so thoroughly uh, you know shot through with monopolies and uh, monopolistic arrangements um, and um, we see, you know, the pr the problems that are typically associated with this, um, and uh, you know, it, it, one of the most notable is pricing the poor out of uh, out of the market. But also, you know, you can see that um, uh, progress that would uh, threaten uh, an an existing uh, line of business is uh, discouraged. And, you know, one example of that was that, uh, you know, 
an analyst here at Goldman Sachs is asking, is curing patients a sustainable business model? You know, the answer uh, in an economy where competition is essentially impossible is, is no, um, because, you know, the profits are already being maximized by uh, chronically treating things. And so curing them doesn't make any sense if people don't have an al any alternative. Um, and so that's kind of the unfortunate result of this. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, many have researched this, uh, one of my, uh, uh, favorite, uh, theorists of this is, uh, is, uh, Mr. Schmitz at Minneapolis Fed. So, you know, he has looked at how monopolies actually do, uh, cause the harms that we've discussed. And, um, in the case of medicine, the harms aren't just economic, they are uh, directly related to, you know, lost uh, lives and, and, you know, really uh, tragic and tragically avoidable health consequences for people. Um, so uh, one of the things that is noted in general that we've seen in, in insulin is, uh, in the case of insulin in particular, is that um, you know, we have uh, uh, seen people, you know, turning to crowdfunding because the cost of insulin when they lose uh, health insurance or health coverage of some sort uh, is, you know, more than many people make in a month. It could be many thousands of dollars a month. Um, so this is really a quite egregious example of how uh, you know, people get priced out of the market uh, fairly quickly. And, you know, it's not just a subtle effect. It is uh, a really, you know, uh, a very large difference in prices that people have to bear to the point where, you know, it'll be uh, exceed everything else that they're paying for in life by quite a bit. Um, so um, just to, make that a little bit more concrete. The cost of manufacture of insulin is about $5 per vial, but the list prices have risen to the point where they're around $300 to $600 per vial in some cases. Um, and, you know, there, these conditions have persisted for decades and uh, they've only gotten worse. Uh, there hasn't been any successful pushback against them yet. Um, so what we are trying to do is, is kind of invert everything that we've observed in our project. Um, so instead of relying on proprietary development and uh, mechanisms of monopoly, we are sharing everything that we develop in a, in a commons. And we are looking to produce insulin in uh, low overhead distributed networks of small scale manufacturing sites. Um, and instead of having this really strong uh, conflict of interest between the producers who are motivated by profits and to deliver profits to investors, um, instead we're looking to have the uh, people who use the insulin actually be directly involved in the uh, the governance uh, of the organizations that are making the insulin so that um, they'll be able to make decisions as to how everything is managed in the interests of um, you know, themselves and each other and the people using the insulin. And um, a helpful side effect of this will hopefully be that we'll be able to uh, be a lot more nimble and uh, you know, actually make a lot more improvements and not be incentivized to keep old things around just because they're already profitable and actually, you know, move things forward and uh, hopefully make progress towards a cure uh, that, you know, might not be economically feasible otherwise. Um, and in part, we're inspired by um, other successes in the diabetes community. Um, so, Although uh, we're the first effort I know of to 
make insulin itself open source. Um, for uh, about 10 years now, people have been working uh, on artificial pancreas systems, which is uh, uh, essentially a software algorithm that controls an insulin pump uh, to determine the timing and the amount of the dose of insulin automatically, uh, usually based on feedback from a continuous glucose monitor. And this is something that uh, was already possible with technology from the 80s, but the manufacturers uh, just never seemed to be able to bring it to market for whatever reason. Um, but once the technology uh, to do this became more widespread, you know, once uh, embedded computers became uh, cheaper and easier to work with and knowledge of software and how to write these kinds of algorithms became more widespread. Um, individual diabetics and small groups were able to just pick up this work and bring it to completion within the space of a few years. And now um, for almost a decade, there have been uh, DIY artificial pancreas systems that uh, you know many people have been relying on and trusting with their own lives and the lives of their children. and uh, you know, they're working very well. And this was done without any, you know, large R&D budgets or institutional overhead. It was just people collaborating in these horizontal networks to solve their own problems and each other's problems. So we're working on uh, enabling this for the insulin itself so that we can kind of complete the uh, open source economy for treating diabetes. Um, and it turns out that the same trends that uh, made the DIY artificial pancreas systems possible are also going to help us. Um, the uh, you know more pervasive uh, and cheap computing technology is going to play uh, some role in letting us automate. Uh, different aspects of the production and purification, and it also just makes it easier for us to collaborate with each other. And uh, so we're seeing signs that we can reproduce this kind of success. And, you know, the result of that will be uh, ideally to move uh, this activity from these, you know, proprietary, uh, fiefdoms and into the commons. And this is something that is good for people. It's uh, very good for business as well, you know, judging by how it's gone uh, with, uh, you know, open source software businesses. Um, but, you know, a major difference is that it actually respects and promotes competition and innovation instead of sabotaging it and, um, you know, causing everything to, to stagnate and people to uh, go on needlessly suffering and dying for no reason. Um, so that's our goal. Um, and uh, we're working on developing both the technology and the organizational forms that are associated with this to, you know, create a comprehensive alternative for the status quo. And uh, we're trying to prioritize the people who uh, currently lack insulin and uh, need it most in uh, how we uh, develop things so that um, we can most directly address the most urgent problems that people in society have. Um, so this is a closer look at the uh, existing supply chain, um, uh, just so that we can contrast it with what we're setting up. So I mentioned earlier that there are, you know, these um, multiple uh, middlemen who uh, operate in these complex networks in between the manufacturer and the consumer. And uh, so I won't even really try to go through this in any detail, but you can see that there are, uh, you know, quite a few uh, complex patterns of interrelationship among them. and. Uh, most of these are 
are done in secret, so you, there's no transparency into how uh, this works in any detail. Um, and, uh, you know, it involves kickbacks being passed up and down the chain and, um, you know, all kinds of uh, things that uh, j just are, are in themselves a, a great challenge to uh, making any sense of things. And so when, when it pr the system produces the nonsensical uh, result of, uh, you know, denying people insulin that they need to survive that costs uh, very little to make, um, you know, this is kind of how that is able to uh, grow and that kind of problem can grow and sustain itself in this environment of artificial complexity. So we're going to address that by um, making things as, as simple and as direct as possible. So right now we're working in our community labs to develop the the microbes and the uh, technology, and then we're going to uh, publish the information associated with them. And then um, using that public information about how the technology works, we're looking at setting up uh, a system of cooperatives where the insulin users can participate directly in the, uh, the ownership and the, the governance of those uh, organizations. And uh, we may also be partnering with uh, hospitals and uh, local pharmacies that already do work that is uh, similar in some technical aspects to this, and they already have, uh, you know, people who would need the insulin. Uh, they have relationships with them, and uh, we may also be looking at uh, collaborating with local and state uh, governments and. Um, you know, aside from these fairly small and, and simple low overhead uh, organizations, it's, it's going to be as, as direct to the users as possible. Um, so um, a closer look at some of the technical work that we're doing. Um, and this is, uh, you know, this is just, just a, a general look at how protein production and purification works and how this applies to insulin. So um, right now we've designed some genetic modifications to um, some microbes. Uh, we have uh, actually three systems we're working on now. This is two of them, um, but we have uh, two yeast-based systems for producing uh, insulin glargine, which is a long-acting insulin, and uh, one E. coli-based for producing uh, Lispro, which is a rapid acting insulin. And so we are, uh, uh, have ongoing work with the microbe engineering. Um, some of it has, has uh, produced some small yields already, but we're working on getting the, the production to be reliable and the yields to a practical level. Um, and then once the microbes are engineered, um, we're gonna focus on a small scale purification system um, initially using uh, uh, proprietary equipment, but we're also working on making open source equipment for that. And uh, we've also, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we've also started uh, to look at the uh, uh, verification and uh, quality assurance questions of making that product uh, suitable for use as a medicine. Um, and so once, we've got all of these aspects in place. We've got all of the technical problems for making insulin in a small scale setting solved. Um, so here's a look at uh, a, a kind of demonstration version of a bioreactor. So um, it is uh, essentially just a bit of plumbing and uh, aside from having to keep it sterile, um, there isn't anything uh, terribly technically complex about it. You're going to have some, uh, you know, uh, some pumps and some valves and temperature sensors, pH sensors, and and that sort of thing. And then for uh, the purification, you're going to have, uh, you know, perhaps a, a column 
which is a you know just a, a tube with certain ports filled with uh, um, some materials that may be a little bit costly, but for the most part, this is something that um, you know you can as as these people have for this demonstration unit, they fit everything you need to do it onto a uh, tabletop. So, um, you know, we can work in a similar envelope. Um, uh, you know, the corner of a room could be enough to produce insulin for, um, you know, a small city if we are, you know, running at a reasonable efficiency. And um, as a result, we can bring the cost of insulin back down to um, what the cost of production already is. Um, so um, our own projections for what our cost of production would be are in line with what they are for the large scale uh, production that dominates right now. So um, based on our preliminary model, we could be providing this to people for seven dollars a vial, which is you know very close to the three to five dollars a vial that it's usually produced for. So um, you know, we're seeing that there isn't really any economy of scale here and that, you know, there isn't any kind of actual technical or economic justification for the uh, limited supply that we see right now. Um, so as I mentioned, we are uh, still working on uh, the microbe engineering, but we have started to work on the open hardware as well. So we're making progress on the uh, technical aspects of this process and um, we're looking forward to uh, reaching some of the milestones on that fairly soon and we've you know begun working not just on the open hardware but also on uh, some of the regulatory and organizational research to uh, make that uh, hypothetical system of cooperatively organized production a reality. So, you know, that's going to uh, involve some outside of the box thinking and we're, you know, getting into looking at a lot of interesting precedents like uh, ideas from personalized medicine and um, other forms of cooperative medicine and healthcare and, um, state level frameworks for things like uh, direct public offerings, you know, uh, financial mechanisms. And so it's, it's really um, taking us uh, on uh, both a, a deep and a broad look at a lot of uh, very promising alternative ways of doing things that we hope will apply not just to insulin, but uh, to perhaps medicine in general and business in general in the near future as well. Um, so here's a closer look at the bioreactor design that we have just recently, uh, just recently completed um, the uh, first look at. So um, as you can see, the bioreactor um, we break it down to the specifics, uh, as I was saying before, it's, it's, it's kind of some pumps and some sensors and, uh, you know, an air pump and some heating pads. And um, this is a design that was uh, based on one that uh, another uh, uh, fellow in the community, uh, Sebastian Kosioba, is working on. So. He was kind enough to show us around his design and uh, we have a group of interns that's working on this right now. Uh, so this was made by uh, Paige Hanoka and uh, it took her uh, just a couple of weeks to come up with this. And the bill of materials for this comes out to uh, $115.80. So um, this would have a capacity of a few liters and a capacity of a few liters if you run it uh, uh, fairly close to continuously that can supply insulin for a few thousand people. So, uh, you know, this is still leaving out the purification and uh, the QA aspects, but, 
you know, those don't add an order of magnitude more cost to this. So you can see that the, you know, capital requirements for doing this are uh, negligible. Um, so we've talked a bit about how we're looking to organize the production ultimately, but we are also uh, organizing the R&D work that we're doing right now in a similar way. So we're a fairly horizontal, open source oriented uh, organization. We're taking cues from other open source foundations that are stewards of different kinds of technology. So we have groups working on the, uh, the wet lab uh, R&D, the hardware um, supporting software for our organization, um, developing the business plans, doing legal and policy research, and uh, doing uh, communications with our supporters and uh, touching on uh, fundraising as well. Um, and here, a few folks from the team. You know, we are a, a, a loosely organized network of volunteers, so people um, uh, kind of come in and out. We weren't able to list everyone, but here are a few of the more uh, regularly involved folks. Um, you know, Jan is our uh, chief scientist working on the microbe stuff. Um, and uh, David and Max are also working on that here in our open lab. Um, Alex Hay recently developed an open source uh, glucometer, which uh, we have a blog post up on our blog about, which is very interesting. Uh, Nicole has been helping us with the legal uh, work that we're doing. Ife uh, has helped us with software. Uh, Louise is working on communications and fundraising with the interns. Uh, Jessica is also um, working on uh, the microbe engineering in the wet lab and with an intern group as well. Uh, Remy has helped us with some uh, collaborations and uh, Kadi is actually one of our international collaborators uh, in Senegal who is uh, getting her lab uh, set up now to uh, join us and perhaps help us uh, look at some new possibilities involving plant-based production. So uh, very interesting potential there. Um, within our group, we uh, fairly uh, horizontal, as I said. So, you know, we uh, kind of go on the open source credo of, uh, you know, loose consensus and uh, working protocols, we could say, and just take on tasks on our initiative um, for the most part. So we've uh, uh, had to collaborate remotely. So, you know, we're doing things in online meetings, which uh, anyone is welcome to join. Um, and, uh, you know, if anyone uh, is interested in that, you can go to our website, openinsulin.org. Um, and we have some posts up there that will uh, give you some contact information, information about the meetings. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, um, I'd, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to uh, hear from any of you if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing or, uh, you know, helping with any aspect of this. And uh, the more the merrier and the more people are helping out, the faster we're going to be able to solve this uh, very urgent problem. So. Uh, it would be a, a pleasure to hear from you. And again, thank you for having me here. And thanks to Nina and the um, Hack Village folks.